Chapter 39 of Great Expectations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, Chapter 39 I was three and twenty years of age. Not another word had I heard to enlighten me on the subject of my expectations. My twenty-third birthday was a week gone. We had left Barnard's Inn more than a year and lived in the temple. Our chambers were at Garden Court down by the river. Mr. Pocket and I had for some time parted company as to our original relations, though we continued on the best terms. Notwithstanding my inability to settle to anything, which I hope arose out of the restless and incomplete tenure on which I held my means, I had a taste for reading and read regularly so many hours a day. That matter of Herbert's was still progressing, and everything with me was as I have brought it down to the close of the last preceding chapter. Business had taken Herbert on a journey to Marseille. I was alone and had a dull sense of being alone, dispirited and anxious, long hoping that tomorrow or next week would clear my way, and long disappointed. I sadly missed the cheerful face and ready response of my friend. It was wretched weather, stormy and wet, stormy and wet, and mud, 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 deep in all the streets. Day after day, vast, heavy veil had been driving over London from the east, and it drove still, as if in the east there were an eternity of cloud and wind. So furious had been the gusts, that high buildings in town had had the lead stripped off their roofs, and in the country, trees had been torn up, and sails of windmills carried away, and gloomy accounts had come in from the coast of shipwreck and death. Violent blasts of rain had accompanied these rages of wind, and the day just closed as I sat down to read had been the worst of all. Alterations had been made in that part of the temple since that time, and it is not now so lonely a character as it had then, nor is it so exposed to the river. We lived at the top of the last house, and the wind rushing up the river shook the house that night like discharges of cannon or breakings of a sea. When the rain came with it and dashed against the windows, I thought, raising my eyes to them as they rocked, that I might have fancied myself in a storm-beaten lighthouse. Occasionally, the smoke came rolling down the chimney as though it could not bear to go out into such a night, and when I set the doors open and looked down the staircase, the staircase lamps were blown out, and when I shaded my face with my hands, and looked through the black windows, opening them ever so little was out of the question in the teeth of such wind and rain. I saw that the lamps in the court were blown out, and that the lamps on the bridges and the shore were shuddering, and that the coal fires and barges on the river were being carried away before the wind like red-hot splashes in the rain. I read with my watch upon the table, purposing to close my book at eleven o'clock. As I shut it, St. Paul's, and all the many church clocks in the city, some leading, some accompanying, some following, struck that hour. The sound was curiously flawed by the wind, and I was listening and thinking how the wind assailed and tore it when I heard a footstep on the stair. What nervous folly made me start and awfully connect it with the footstep of my dead sister matters not was passed in a moment, and I listened again and heard the footsteps stumble in coming on. Remembering then that the staircase lights were blown out, I took up my reading lamp and went out to the stairhead. Whoever was below had stopped on seeing my lamp, for all was quiet. There is someone down there, is there not? I called out, looking down. Yes, said a voice from the darkness beneath. What floor do you want? The top, Mr. Pip. That is my name. There's nothing the matter. Nothing the matter, returned the voice. And the 
man came on. I stood with my lamp held out over the stair rail and he came slowly within its light. It was a shaded lamp to shine upon a book, and its circle of light was very contracted, so that he was in it for a mere instant and then out of it. In the instant I had seen a face that was strange to me, looking up with an incomprehensible air of being touched and pleased by the sight of me. Moving the lamp as the man moved, I made out that he was substantially dressed, but roughly, like a voyager by sea, that he had long iron-gray hair, that his age was about sixty, that he was a muscular man, strong on his legs, and that he was browned and hardened by exposure to weather. As he ascended the last stair or two, and the light of my lamp included us both, I saw with a stupid kind of amazement that he was holding out both his hands to me. Pray, what is your business? I asked him. My business, he repeated, pausing. Ah, yes. I will explain my business by your leave. Do you wish to come in? Yes, he replied. I wish to come in, master. I had asked him the question inhospitably enough, for I resented the sort of bright and gratified recognition that still shone in his face. I resented it, because it seemed to imply that he expected me to respond to it. But I took him into the room I had just left, and having set the lamp on the table, asked him as civilly as I could to explain himself. He looked about him with the strangest air, an air of wondering pleasure as if he had some part in the things he admired. And he pulled off a rough outer coat and his hat. Then I saw that his head was furrowed and bald, and that the long iron-gray hair grew only on its sides. But I saw nothing that in the least explained him. On the contrary, I saw him next moment, once more holding out both his hands to me. What do you mean? said I, half expecting him to be mad. He stopped in his looking at me and slowly rubbed his right hand over his head. It's disappointing to a man, he said in a coarse, broken voice, after having looked forward so distant and come so far. But you're not to blame for that. Neither on us is to blame for that. I'll speak in half a minute. Give me half a minute, please. He sat down on a chair that stood before the fire and covered his forehead with his large brown Venice hands. I looked at him attentively then and recoiled a little from him, but I did not know him. There's no one nigh, said he, looking over his shoulder. Is there? Why do you, a stranger coming into my rooms at this time of night, ask that question? said I. You're a game one, he returned, shaking his head at me with a deliberate affection, at once most unintelligible and most exasperating. I'm glad you growed up a game one, but don't catch hold of me. You'll be sorry afterwards to have done it. I relinquished the intention he had detected, for I knew him. Even yet I could not recall a single feature, but I knew him. The wind and rain had driven away the intervening years, had scattered all the intervening objects, had swept us to the churchyard where we first stood face to face on such different levels. I could not have known my convict more distinctly than I knew him now as he sat in the chair before the fire. No need to take a file from his pocket and show it to me. No need to take the handkerchief from his neck and twist it round his head. No need to hug himself with both his arms and take a shivering turn across the room, looking back at me for recognition. I knew him before he gave me one of those aids, though a moment before I had not been conscious of remotely suspecting his identity. He came back to where I stood and again held out both his hands, not knowing what to do, for in my astonishment I had lost my self-possession, and I reluctantly gave him my hands. He grasped them heartily, raised them to his lips, kissed them, and still held them. You acted noble, my boy, said he. Noble, Pip, and I have never forgot it. 
At a change in his manner, as if he were even going to embrace me, I laid a hand upon his breast and put him away. Stay, said I. Keep off. If you are grateful to me for what I did when I was a little child, I hope you have shown your gratitude by mending your way of life. If you have come here to thank me, it was not necessary. Still, however you have found me out, there must be something good in the feeling that has brought you here. And I will not repulse you, but surely you must understand that I... My attention was so attracted by the singularity of his fixed look at me that the words died away on my tongue. You was the same, he observed, when we had confronted one another in silence. That surely I must understand. What surely must I understand? that I cannot wish to renew that chance intercourse with you of long ago under these different circumstances. I am glad to believe you have repented and recovered yourself. I am glad to tell you so. I am glad that, thinking I deserve to be thanked, you have come to thank me. But our ways are different ways, nonetheless. You are wet and you look weary. Will you drink something before you go? He had replaced his neckerchief loosely and had stood, keenly observant of me, biting a long end of it. I think, he answered, still with the end at his mouth and still observant of me, that I will drink, I thank you, before I go. There was a tray ready on a side table. I brought it to the table near the fire and asked him what he would have. He touched one of the bottles without looking at it or speaking. I made him some hot rum and water. I tried to keep my hands steady while I did so, but his look at me as he leaned back in his chair with a long draggled end of his neckerchief between his teeth, evidently forgotten, made my hand very difficult to master. When at last I put the glass to him, I saw with amazement that his eyes were full of tears. Up to this time I had remained standing, not to disguise that I wished him gone, but I was softened by the softened aspect of the man, and felt a touch of reproach. I hope, said I, hurriedly putting something into a glass for myself, and drawing a chair to the table, that you would not think I spoke harshly to you just now. I had no intention of doing it, and I am sorry for it if I did. I wish you well and happy. As I put my glass to my lips, he glanced with surprise at the end of his neckerchief, dropping from his mouth when he opened it, and stretched out his hand. I gave him mine, and then he drank and drew his sleeve across his eyes and forehead. How are you living? I asked him. I have been a sheep farmer, stock breeder, other trades besides, way in the new world, said he. Many a thousand mile of stormy water off from this. I hope you've done well. I've done wonderfully well. There's others went out a longer me as has done well too. But no man has done nigh as well as me. I'm famous for it. I am glad to hear it. I hope to hear you say so, my dear boy. Without stopping to try to understand those words or the tone in which they were spoken, I turned off to a point that had just come to my mind. Have you ever seen a messenger you once sent to me, I inquired, since he undertook that trust? Never set eyes upon him. I warn't likely to it. He came faithfully, and he brought me the two one-pound notes. I was a poor boy then, as you know and to a poor boy they were a little fortune. But, like you, I have done well since, and you must let me pay them back. You can put them to some other poor boy's use. I took out my purse. He watched me as I laid my purse upon the table and opened it, and he watched me as I separated two one-pound notes from its contents. They were clean and new, and I spread them out and handed them over to him. Still watching me, he laid them one upon the other, folded them longwise, gave them a twist, set fire to them at the lamp, and dropped the ashes into the tray. May I make so bold, 
He said that with a smile that was like a frown, and with a frown that was like a smile. As ask you how you have done well since you and me was out on them lone shivery marshes. How? Ha! He emptied his glass, got up, and stood at the side of the fire with his heavy brown hand on the mantel shelf. He put a foot up to the bars to dry and warm it, and the wet boot began to steam. But he neither looked at it nor at the fire, but steadily looked at me. It was only now that I began to tremble. When my lips had parted and had shaped some words that were without sound, I forced myself to tell him, though I could not do it distinctly, that I had been chosen to succeed to some property. My demir varmint ask what property, said he. I faltered. I don't know. My demir varmint ask whose property, said he. I faltered again. I don't know. Could I make a guess, I wonder, said the convict, at your income since you come of age, as to the first figure now. Five? With my heart beating like a heavy hammer of disordered action, I rose out of my chair and stood with my hand upon the back of it, looking wildly at him. Concerning a guardian, he went on, there ought to have been some guardian or such like whilst you was a minor. Uh, some lawyer, maybe. As to the first letter of that lawyer's name now, would it be J? All the truth of my position came flashing on me, and its disappointments, dangers, disgraces, consequences of all kinds rushed in such a multitude that I was borne down by them and had to struggle for every breath I drew. Put it, he resumed, as the employer of that lawyer whose name begun with a J and might be Jaggers, put it as he had come overseas to Portsmouth and had landed there and had wanted to come on to you. However you have found me out, you says just now. Well, However, did I find you out? Why, I wrote from Portsmouth to a person in London for particulars of your address. That person's name? Why, Wemmick. I could not have spoken one word, though it had been to save my life. I stood with a hand on the chair back and a hand on my breast, where I seemed to be suffocating. I stood so, looking wildly at him, until I grasped at the chair when the room began to surge and turn. He caught me, drew me to the sofa, put me up against the cushions, and bent on one knee before me, bringing the face that I now well remembered, and that I shuddered at, very near to mine. Yes, Pip, dear boy, I've made a gentleman on you. It's me what has done it. I swore that time, sure as ever I earned a guinea, that guinea should go to you. I swore afterwards, sure as ever I speculated and got rich, you should get rich. I lived rough, that you should live smooth. I worked hard, that you should be above work. What odds, dear boy? Do I tell it for you to feel an obligation? Not a bit. I tell it for you to know as that there hunted dunghill dog what you kept life in, got his head so high that he could make a gentleman. And Pip, you're him. The abhorrence in which I held the man, the dread I had of him, the repugnance with which I shrank from him, could not have been exceeded if he had been some terrible beast. Looky here, Pip. I'm your second father. You're my son, more to me nor any son. I put away money, only for you to spend. When I was a hired-out shepherd in a solitary hut, not seeing no faces but faces of sheep till I half forgot what men's and women's faces was like, I seen your. I drops my knife many a time in that hut when I was a-eatin' my dinner or my supper, and I says, here's the boy again looking at me whilst I eats and drinks. I see you there a many times 
as plain as ever I see you on them misty marshes. Lord, strike me dead, I says each time, and I goes out in the air to say it under the open heavens. But what, if I gets liberty and money, I'll make that boy a gentleman. And I done it. Why, look at you, dear boy. Look at these here lodgings of yourn, fit for a lord. A lord! Huh? You shall show money with lords for wagers, and beat em. In his heat and triumph, and in his knowledge that I had been nearly fainting, he did not remark on my reception of all this. It was the one grain of relief I had. Looky here, he went on, taking my watch out of my pocket, and turning towards him a ring on my finger, while I recoiled from his touch as if he had been a snake. A golden and a beauty, that's a gentleman's, I hope. A diamond all set round with rubies, that's a gentleman's, I hope. Look at your linen, fine and beautiful. Look at your clothes, better ain't to be got. And your books, too, turning his eyes round the room, mounting up on their shelves by hundreds. And you read them, don't you? I see you've been a-reading of them when I come in. <laughs> you shall read them to me, dear boy. And if they're in foreign languages what I don't understand, I shall be just as proud as if I did. Again he took both my hands and put them to his lips, while my blood ran cold within me. Don't you mind talking, Pip? said he, after again drawing his sleeve over his eyes and forehead, as the click came in his throat, which I well remembered. He was all the more horrible to me that he was so much in earnest. You can't do better, nor keep quiet, dear boy. You ain't looked slowly forward to this as I have. You wasn't prepared for this as I was. But didn't you never think it might be me? Oh, no, 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 I returned. Never, never. Well, you see, it was me, and single-handed. Never a soul in it but my own self and Mr. Jaggers. Was there no one else? I asked. No, said he with a glance of surprise. Who else should there be? And, dear boy, how good-looking you have grown. There's bright eyes somewheres, eh? Isn't there bright eyes somewheres, what you love the thoughts on? Oh, Estella, Estella. They shall be yourn, dear boy, if money can buy them. Not the gentleman like you, so well set up as you can't win him off of his own game. But money shall back you. Let me finish what I was a-telling you, dear boy. From that there hut, and that there hiring out, I got money left me by my master, which died and had been the same as me, and got my liberty and went for myself. In every single thing I went for, I went for you. Lord, strike a blight upon it, I says, whatever it was I went for, if it ain't for him. It all prospered wonderful. As I give you to understand just now, I'm famous for it. It was the money left me, and the gains of the first few year what I sent home to Mr. Jaggers, all for you, when he first come after you, agreeable to my letter. Oh, that he had never come, that he had left me at the forge, far from contented, yet, by comparison, happy. And then, dear boy, it was a recompense to me, looky here, to know in secret that I was making a gentleman. The blood horses of them colonists might fling up the dust over me as I was walking. What do I say? I says to myself, I'm making a better gentleman nor ever you'll be. When one of them says to another, he was a convict a few year ago and is a ignorant common fellow now, for all he's lucky. What do I say? I says to myself, if I ain't a gentleman, nor yet ain't got no learning, I'm the owner of such. All of you own stock and land. Which of you owns a brought-up 